Yo, what is up guys? Welcome to MST.TV. This is Nishi bringing you all another Market Watch episode. So we finally got our first taste of competitive Yu-Gi-Oh! after the January 2020 ban list, and the format is looking pretty diverse. There were a lot of different decks that did well and topped, a lot of which were pretty unexpected, which I think is really great for the game, and as a result we're seeing a bunch of movement on the market. However, it is also extremely important that when we look at card prices and card price movements, we put an asterisk next to absolutely everything. On one hand, we have the master rule changes coming and then probably a ban list coming as well in April. The meta could look entirely different after, right? We could see something like Quick Fix being banned, and then all of a sudden, Shadals are like the best deck of the format again. Who knows? On the other hand, we also have to remember that we are approaching reprint season, with the most notable reprint set coming being Dual Overload that comes out in March. We just apparently had a reprint of Phantasme leaked, so it is very possible that with any of the cards that we see spiking, they could also be reprinted really, really soon. That being said, personally, I I think that the best approach to take is to sell things that are spiking unless you're extremely confident that they aren't going to get reprinted. And when you're buying, keep that possibility of reprints in the back of your mind. Don't be too aggressive or greedy and grab more copies of a card than you're going to be able to move or you're willing to risk. Alright guys, with that out of the way, let's jump right into it. First up, we have Witch's Strike, which is a secret rare card from Savage Strike. This is a card that allows you to blow up your opponent's board and hand if your opponent negates the summon of your monster, or they negate the activation of your card or effect. Now, I believe that people buying this card is purely speculative or theory. I didn't see it in anyone's top deck list from over the weekend. What I did see, though, is a lot of people citing copies of Solemn Strike, Solemn Warning, and Solemn Judgment which is actually pretty interesting, and I guess this card can be seen as being used to punish those counter traps. The problem that I have with Witch's Strike is that it's kind of awkward and slow. Like, you have to use it when you're going first, you set it, then you let your opponent go, then during your next turn when you try to do something and your opponent tries to disrupt you, then you can flip it. Well, if your opponent is going second, why are they putting in cards like Solemn Strike or Warning or Judgment? You would kind of have to, like, mind game your opponent into that, and I feel like that would be an inconsistent strategy at best. The other thing is that I feel like you have to allow your opponent to set up a negate or disruption in order for Witch's Strike to actually be effective and for you to resolve its effect, but I would much rather play cards, something like Droll and Lockbird, that prevent my opponent from setting up their board at all. It kind of doesn't really make sense to me, to be honest, and I'm not entirely sold on this card, but if I'm wrong or I'm not seeing something, please let me know in the comments down below. This card is currently a $10 card, which is up from its previous market price of $5 that it was sitting at for quite a while. However, in my opinion, this is definitely a card that you should all be selling, as I truly don't believe that it's going to be having any impact on the competitive meta. Next, let's take a look at Zodiacs. So the Zodiac archetype actually had a couple of tops this weekend, one with Pure and one with Sky Strikers, even though they don't have key cards in the deck in Broad Bull and Dryden, which is actually pretty impressive. The deck hasn't really been relevant in forever, and so this one odd top actually made several cards jump up in price. Nothing too crazy, we saw baby bumps to cards like Zodiac Chacanine or Ultimate Rare Whiptails, but the most notable jump was in the price of Zodiac Barrage, which has gone from before being like a dollar or two to now being an $8 card for either secret or version. It's kind of the key card in the deck that allows it to start off its combo, though obviously those combos aren't as great now as they were before. When I look at Zodiac, I don't think that the strategy itself is very strong. I think that the success that we saw from it was more from the fact that it's a consistent, relatively compact engine that is able to function alongside a lot of different hand traps and ride those hand traps to victory. As much as Zodiacs are now kind of like a cool rogue deck for people to play, I don't think that they're going to be anywhere nearly as competitive as they were before, especially when everything else gets a bigger buff when the master rule changes, so I would move your barrage quickly while they're still a bit hyped up. The other card of note related to Zodiac is Infinitrack Fortress Megaclops, a Link 3 monster that you can make using 3 Ixies monsters. 
This is basically what allowed the Zodiac deck to top at all. The guy playing Pure Zoo ran three copies of this card. It's immune to monster effects other than the effects of Xyz monsters. So unless your opponent is playing something like really weird or strange, something like Diamond Dire Wolf or Castell, which you don't see any play this format, or they're running something that can beat over a 4,000 attack point monster in battle, this card is pretty impossible to get through once it does hit the board. So yeah, it's super easy to make in Zodiac, but hasn't really had any attention up until now because it is a kind of awkward condition to meet in order to make this card. So this card has gone from being less than a dollar like a bulk card all the way up to being $5 a piece, which isn't too bad. I know that myself, I left some copies in my bulk that I now have to go and dig out. So hopefully you guys can grab your copies too. And while it is possible that Zodiac could be a good deck again, I don't think that they will be unless they got back like Broadbull and Dryden back to three or something. So I'm gonna recommend moving Megaclops to a buyer if you can, while you can. Next up, let's look at Psyframe Lord Lambda. With the Master Rule changes coming up, I think a lot of people are looking at Luna Light Time Thief as a potentially top tier deck. We're even seeing the deck do relatively well now, and that's without the Master Rule changes. That being said, Lambda is a card that has a lot of synergy with the strategy. It is an easy link to to make, as you can use any two non-token monsters, and when you banish Redoer with its own effect, Lambda's effect procs allowing you to search for Gamma during the end phase, basically guaranteeing you that extra hand trap negate during your opponent's turn. With this card being released just last year in the Battles of Legends set, I think it could be quite a while before we see it reprinted, however I do think it is going to see an increase in demand and therefore an increase in price. Not long ago, the card was sitting at around $6-7 to $7 or so, and now it's basically double that at $13 a piece. To be completely honest, I am expecting this card to be one of the next buyout targets within the next couple months, and I'm expecting it to hit around $20-$25 to $25 a piece. So I would definitely recommend grabbing your copies soon, especially if you want to play Luna Light Time Thief. Another card that I want to briefly bring to your attention is Ultimate Rare Fire Formation Tanky, a card that was just bought out I think last week. It's currently sitting at $85 lowest on TCG Player, which is really really high, up from the 50-ish price range that we're used to seeing. Honestly, we see a buyout of ulti tanky every year or two, it seems to keep on getting bought out whenever we get any sort of hype surrounding any beast warrior archetype and then coming back down after. This time, with Luna Lights being a popular Beast Warrior archetype, it has jumped again. Personally, I don't want to spend over $250 for a set of this card, so I have a set of secrets that I am keeping for myself to use instead. So yeah, if you do have this card, it is pretty safe to say that unless it's part of like your collection and you want to keep it, I would recommend selling this card and then buying it back again when it inevitably dips. Next is a card that I'm personally really really fond of that actually saw some side deck play over the past weekend and that is a pointer of the Red Lotus. So if you don't know what this is, you can pay 2000 life points, look at your opponent's hand and then you get to banish a card there until the end of your opponent's next end phase. So two turns if you're going first, flipping it during their first turn. So ever since we saw Mind Crush effectively get nerfed, it really hasn't seen any play. You no longer get to check your opponent's hand to verify that Mind Crush is resolving properly, so therefore you don't get that information advantage, and the card has largely fallen out of favor. A pointer is the new alternative as the card specifically states that you get to look at your opponent's hand. Now on one hand, this card is slightly worse because you have to pay 2000 life points, your opponent only loses the card temporarily, and you don't get to hit multiple cards of the same name with it. But on the other hand though, against the right deck at the right time, this card will be absolutely devastating. Like without quick fix, spirals aren't really able to play at all, or against like Altergeist, getting rid of that multi faker means that their turns are going to be really really underwhelming. Anyways guys, this is another one of those cards that has never been reprinted but is suddenly viable again and so it carries a six dollar price tag just for a common which is you know kind of silly but nothing that we haven't seen before whether you want to buy this card or not is up to you i mean there is certainly going to be other side deck cards that you could play but i mean like depending on your play style personally i really like the information that you gain from this card and i already have my set so i'm probably going to try it out i could definitely see this card being reprinted as an 
OTS pack common, but I could also see it flying completely under the radar and then becoming a 10 to $15 common before Konami picks up on it. So really it is up to you. All right, so really quickly, let's talk about Pot of Extravagance. So this card has become really, really popular and has helped to make a lot of decks really good. So on one hand, it's good in decks like Subterror or Altergeist or Dinosaurs, where you aren't really dependent on your extra deck in order to function, and the card just allows you to draw more cards. However, it has also seen success in Spiral, where you can play three copies of a card like Appaloosa, and then you don't care about banishing one or two of them, as long as you have one left that you can end your board with, and because you need to draw into certain combo pieces in order for the deck to function. Now, as a result of this card seeing so much play, we did see a buyout of Pot of Extravagance, as the card spiked to being $130 to $140. However, with the Phantasme reprint just being apparently leaked, people are concerned about the possibility of both cards being reprinted in Dual Overload, as the two cards were originally from the same set, Savage Strike. As a result, we have seen the price of this card fall all the way back down to around $90 a piece. Now, in my personal opinion, I don't think that it's going to be reprinted until the Megatons, as Savage Strike now falls within that like cutoff range, and they need to include some chase cards in order to help sell their Megatons this year, unless we get some like broken promos like Nibiru and Dark Ruler No More, but even then there needs to be some cards that are included as chase cards within the Megaton set itself. Phantasme makes sense in Dual Overload, especially with the Master Rule change, but there isn't an immediate need to see Extravagance reprinted in Dual Overload as well. That being said, until we do get a full spoiler for Dual Overload, expect the price of Pot of Extravagance to stay pretty steady, maybe drop as low as $80 a piece, but then jump back up when it's confirmed not to be included in the set. So as I'm sure most of you guys know, Lightning Storm is a card that now exists, and if you don't have something like Solemn Judgment up to negate it, you could very well lose your entire back row, which means you could lose the game if you're playing a deck like Altergeist or Subterror. Now one of the ways that these decks have adapted is by playing Waking the Dragon in the side deck in order to punish people who are playing Lightning Storm. When Waking the Dragon is destroyed, you get to summon a monster out of your extra deck for free, and Naturia Exterio is one of the best options for that. You can use it to negate any spell or trap cards by banishing a card from your graveyard and then milling a card from the top of your deck. Obviously a really easy condition to meet, and against the right deck this card could completely prevent your opponent from playing the game at all. We're now looking at around $8 for the secret rare version and $11 for the dual terminal version, which isn't actually too bad, but do keep in mind that both of these prints are quite old, so they're probably going to be a bit on the harder side to find. But if you do want to play one of those back row heavy strategies, this card alongside Waking the Dragon might be something you want to consider picking up. Speaking of Waking the Dragon targets, the other card that you should be taking into consideration is the Last Warrior from Another Planet. When this card is special summoned, you destroy all other monsters you control, but while it's on the field, neither player can summon monsters at all. This means that they will have to set monsters, or they have to destroy this card by using like spell or trap removal, or by discarding something like Danger Bigfoot, or by trying to negate its effect. Now against some strategies, this can be very problematic, unless they have access to a copy of like Lightning Storm or Infinite Impermanence, not being able to put monsters on board typically means that you can't play the game at all. This card is very similar to Naturia Exterio in that in the right matchup it could single-handedly win you the game. Now this card is a slightly more expensive alternative, it only has two printings I believe, both of which are like really really old, like the original Labyrinth of Nightmare, and then a reprint in Dark Beginnings 2 I want to say. At any rate, we're looking at around $25 for a single copy of this card. If you're playing Goats actually, I think there's a good chance that you'll probably have one of these in your extra deck. I know I have like an extra set lying around somewhere, so it's definitely an option that you'll want to keep in mind for your side decks. Okay, so Evil Zord Dolka is a card that is utilized by dinosaurs, but isn't necessarily something that the deck needs to go into by any means. The deck can set up pretty scary boards with cards like Ultimate Conductor Tyranno and True King of All Calamities, but another important option to keep in mind is Evil Zord Dolka, a rank 4 that can be made with Soul Eating Overraptor and Giant Rex. For a deck that isn't extremely dependent on the extra deck, Dolka is a really really good option for the deck to have available, 
as it can provide two monster effect negations in the same turn. However, unfortunately the card only has two printings, its original secret rare print and then another secret rare reprint as the cover card of a tin from 2012, which means the last time that we saw this card reprinted was almost eight years ago. As a result, we've seen a bit of a buyout for both versions of the card as the cheapest copy available on TCG Player at the moment is about $13 a piece, which is kind of crazy, especially for a tin promo. If you do have this card lying around and can find someone who really wants it, then I would definitely look into moving it because the card isn't exactly necessary and it can of course be replaced by something like Evils or Lagia. But if you're playing a Dino deck, I think that this card is definitely something that you should want to have access to because it is an incredibly strong option. All right, guys, that is it from me for today's episode. It did kind of feel like all over the place, but there's really just so much happening on the market right now. It's crazy. I love it, though. I love it when the market is like this because it presents us with a lot of opportunities to buy and sell cards. And honestly, if you follow everything, there's a lot of money that you can make from it as well. But yeah, that is it from me for today. If you guys did enjoy the discussion, please hit that thumbs up button for me. And of course, leave a comment down below. Let me know what you guys think about what's going on in the market, or maybe tell me about what cards I might have missed so that I can cover it in a future video. And of course, make sure that you're subscribed to both Tombox and more importantly, me for all of the latest content. And uh, yeah, until next time guys, don't forget to hold on to your MST.TV.